Today we're going to talk about medical school histology basic, the lymphoidal system. We want to gain a greater appreciation for the diversity uh, of uh, cells and structures in the lymphoidal tissue uh, and to uh, see how those structures and cells facilitate the variation in function of the lymphoidal system. Thank you. Medical School Histology Basic, Lymphoidal Tissue. Hi, I'm Larry Johnson. I'm a professor at Texas A&M University, and today we're going to talk about the lymphoidal system. Now, what are some examples of the immune response that maybe you have encountered? Reactions against bacteria, microorganisms, bacteria, viruses. You probably had the flu before. Uh, hopefully, you haven't had any parasites. But certainly you've had like pimples or something, uh, some kind of infection, ant bite, uh, or something that has caused an immune response. Uh, other things are, are tumor cells, reaction to tumor cells. We don't have cancer because our immune system has prevented that. Maybe you have allergies, hay fever, poison ivy, all those are immune responses. And autoimmune uh, disease, such as arthritis, or type 1 diabetes, you might know someone with diabetes, and graft rejection, all of these are the immune responses uh, that we may have countered or know about uh, in the body. Now, the objectives of this presentation is to uh, look at the cellular basis of immunity, look at the factors of the response, the induction of the response, and ontogeny, where did it come from uh, uh, in this developmental path? Now, the functions of the immune system is to protect against foreign invaders of the body, and there's many, many invaders, viruses, parasites, bacteria, um, lots of things that are trying to invade the body, and to produce and protect the germ-free environment of the body. So, protect against pathogens, uh, invaders and also to protect a germ-free environment. So there's basically three steps in combating infection. One step is to break the transmission, uh, the cycle of transmission. You prevent it from getting into the body. Uh, a second way is to kill the infective agents and third is to increase the host immunity, the increase the, uh, the immunity of the host. So the first lines of defense of our body is our skin. Uh, skin, the stratum corneum, prevents things from coming through. Uh, and uh, the bacteria that's on the surface of the skin doesn't get inside because of our skin. Also, things that we eat. The hydrochloric acid in the stomach and the mucus uh, in the intestines prevent uh, invasion of things that we eat into uh, uh, the, the body's milieu. Uh, inside the epithelium. So that is we break in the transmission uh, cycle. Also we kill the infective agents. That's why we have the pathogens at work. Neutrophils, uh, uh, macrophages from monocytes uh, throughout the body. And here we can see in the liver, uh, in, in the skin, in the brain, lymph nodes, in the bone, spleen, various places, synovial fluid, uh, we have these killer cells that kill the bacteria or, in, or invading uh, components. Here we see some neutrophils in blood, monocyte that gives rise to the macrophage lymphocyte that we see. So increase the host resistance, characteristics of immunity. Uh, first component is it's required. It requires exposure to antigens before it can mount a response. Also, it's specific. Is specific uh, to uh, the unique antigens that you're exposed to. That's why if you're getting, um, you may get sick uh, from water that's in a, a different location, different country, and other people who come to the United States from other countries may get sick too on our water uh, because they're not exposed to the same um, uh, invading components uh, as we are. Uh, also, it has memory. It remembers a previous exposure. 
So it's acquired, it must be developed. So the antigen that we're exposed to, we make antibodies against those specific antigens and not other antigens. Uh, also, the specificity is specific about those specific ones and not other ones, and it has to be acquired. That is, it has to be exposed to that uh, so the immune system can know what uh, to mount a response to. Also, it has memory. It has a quick response. The first response uh, is small and, and, and not so quick. Uh, but the second time you're injected with the same antigen, it has a quick response, as indicated here in the serum concentration of antibodies. Uh, and uh, the main player here is the lymphocyte, the T lymphocyte which kills things, or the B lymphocytes, which makes plasma cells that make antibodies. And that brings us to the two types uh, of responses. One is antibody. That is, the glycoproteins produced by cells, these antibodies, are actually the invading, the, the killer component. Uh, there's also a cell mediated. So this is a product, or this is the cells themselves uh, that actually bind to the tissue and kill those. And those are T cells as opposed to B cells. Now this occurs in the bone marrow and you can see colonies of cells uh, developing. This is a group of cells here and some of which have granules as we see. Uh, there's a blood vessel uh, with white blood cells coming through uh, blood. Uh, there's a megakaryocyte that produces platelets and there's a piece of bone. So this is in bone marrow. And here's a smear of the bone marrow cells. And so we can see this cell here, a spherical nucleus, dark blue cytoplasm. This is like a pro-normal blast is going to make a red blood cell. And then if you go further, you can see uh, where the nucleus pops out, and then you have no, no nucleus and the mature red blood cells. And so throughout the body, we have these immune organs that will facilitate this. We have the spleen, Priors patches uh, in the gut. Uh, we have bone marrow. We have a thymus. And we have lymph nodes throughout the body. And a main player here is the lymphocyte, but also white blood cells, uh, other white blood, uh, white blood cells as well. And many of them start with the thymus. The T lymphocytes come from the thymus. We have the a cortex and a medulla uh, in the thymus. And then also from the bone marrow. Bone marrow, a lot of pluripotent cells, uh, uh, cells reside, produced by a pluripotent cell uh, that's located in there that makes all the different uh, blood cells. So with, our, with the uh, thymus, we see it has different lobes, one lobe here, one lobe there, and it has a cortex on the outside and the medulla on the inside. In the medulla we have these Hassler's corpuscles uh, that is produced and there's characteristic of the thymus. So if we look at the thymus, here's a piece of thymus here, let's see different lobes. We see a dark area which is the cortex and a lighter area which is a medulla and here we see the Hassler's corpuscles located in there. There's another one right there in the medulla. Now in the in the cortex uh, of the thymus, we have a blood thymus barrier. We have continuous capillaries that are attached to one another by zonia occludens, and they are sheathed by epithelial reticular cells around each. And that characterizes the blood vessels in the cortex and is responsible for the blood thymus barrier. Also, there's no afferent lymphatics. So there's no lymphatics bringing fluid uh, into uh, into the thymus because it's a primary organ and it needs to develop uh, these cells without uh, the antigens being present. And in those we can see uh, the thymocyte, which are these dark cells here. Uh, we can see mitotic figures in them as they're proliferating. Also we see these epithelial reticulum cells. You can see the nucleus of it here, the nucleus there, and the cytoplasm. Um, uh, that we see those cells are nurse cells and they help uh, uh, prevent uh, blood-borne antigens going into uh, the, the thymus uh, cortex. And then from, from 
from there we see those epithelial cells uh, here and here and they wound up to make their Hassel's corpuscles that we see in the medulla. So they're located in the medulla, the lighter area of the thymus uh, uh, lobe uh, that, that you see. So you see there's a blood thymus barrier in the cortex. Uh, another organ is the lymph node. And here, uh, this is a secondary organ. And so it does have uh, afferent lymphatics, uh, fluid draining into it. it. has an efferent lymphatic of fluid coming out. Uh, and it has a cortex and a medulla as well. Uh, and in the cortex, we see these follicles. Follicles with a germinal center or a lighter region that we see. Also, it has a capsule on, our, on the outside, and right around on the inside there is a subcapsular sinus. So fluid comes in here, percolates down through here, and then ultimately goes out the efferent the lymphatic. And so here we can see these are afferent lymphatics, that is bringing fluid into the lymph node, and you can see some of them even have valves, they're lined by endothelial cells, and you can see the lymph uh, coming in, and it, then it comes in through the subcapsular sinus, which is right in through there. Uh, this is a follicle and another follicle over there with a germinal center, and this is a cortex and a medulla in that region. And so uh, here we can see the capsule, uh, the capsule as we can see there, and below there is a subcapsular sinus, and then these are follicles. Here in green, you can see where fluid comes in through the afferents, and then it percolates down through, and then finally goes out the efferent uh, lymphatic, and it uh, comes in through here around the subcapsular sinus uh, that we see right in through there. We can see again the subcapsular sinus. Here's a capsule, uh, and this is the subcapsular space uh, here and there, and afferent lymphatic that we see. So we're talking about this space. Right in through there is where fluid comes through here and then percolates down. So the capsule, germinal center, and it's in the, uh, here we see predominant B lymphocytes uh, in the follicles themselves. And right here in the uh, marginal zone uh, is where we actually find uh, the, um, this is actually the parafollicular region, I should say. This is where we see the T lymphocytes. So the B lymphocytes is in the follicle. T lymphocytes is in the parafollicular region that is near the follicles. And also this is where we have a high endothelial venules. So you have uh, endothelial cells that look more like cu uh, cube cells, cube cells uh, around these uh, venules. Uh, so you got the venules with endothelial cells that look more like cubes than flattened. Uh, and this is the site of the blood-borne lymphocytes that enter the lymph node. So blood comes in through here, bringing lymph, uh, lymphocytes, and they enter the lymph node uh, at that site to interact with the fluid that's coming through to see if they have the one that uh, reacts with the specific antigens that are there. Now, near the follicle is the parafollicular region, and this is where you have these high endothelial venules that you can see. So, uh, as blood comes in through there, then it's right in these high endothelial venules, site of lymphocyte entry into the load and, node, and it is a one-way street, namely that lymphocytes can come out, but they cannot go in there. The way they leave uh, the lymph node is through the efferent uh, lymphatic. Uh, that we see here. So they enter through the bloodstream and then come out through uh, the lymphatic. So a typical endothelial cell is flat, but here we see they're more cubed or high endothelial venules. So what happened in the node uh, is that uh, lymphocytes come out uh, in this uh, region uh, and they uh, interact with the afferent lymphatic fluid coming in through there and then they go out back through the thoracic duct, around the heart, back to the bloodstream, and then come around and recirculates, circulates again. So recirculation is a very, very important part uh, of uh, uh, the surveillance uh, of the lymphocytes throughout the body. Uh, and so it goes from one lymph node to another lymph node. Uh, and so the, the uh, lymphocytes that can respond to specific uh, antigens will uh, travel around until they find that antigen so they can make a response. And the response may be to produce antibodies, a plasma cell to produce antibodies, 
or maybe to a, a killer cell themselves. And here we see in the lymph node, these are the are the cords, the maxillary cords, and this is a maxillary sinus. So this is where the uh, lymph fluid is going through here, and then these are the cords that we see with the uh, capsule uh, on the outside. And then uh, uh, after uh, the, the fluid is percolated through uh, the cortex and medulla, then it goes out through the efferent lymphatic, and I think that's what this is here, efferent uh, lymphatic. So the efferent lymphatic going is, is taking fluid and lymphocytes out of a lymph node. So they come in through the afferents and go out through the efferent lymphatic. Another organ is the tonsils. And we see the tonsils. You have stratified squamous epithelium characterizing the lining of the gums and the oral cavity. Um, and we also have lymphoidal tissue there. And so we can see there, this is the lymphoidal tissue, mostly lymphocytes. Uh, located in through here. Here's uh, stratified squamous epithelium with nuclei all the way to the bottom, non creatinized epithelium of the oral cavity, uh, and we have these uh, lymphoidal nodules, again, follicles with germinal centers. Uh, that would be there, but there's no capsule uh, around those. Here we can see this is the oral cavity. Here is stratified squamous epithelium, uh, and below there is a host of lymphocytes of the tonsils. Uh, and the purpose of tonsils uh, is that, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, you have to be exposed to antigens for the immune system to react to it. So whenever you're eating something, it's already immediately being exposed to antigens that it needs to respond to whenever that food stuff uh, gets down, uh, get down the GI tract. And here we see down the GI tract, this is esophagus. So we have a lymph nodule in through there, and there's a germinal center. So these are most lymphocytes that can react to the food stuff that you eat. Also in the stomach, uh, we have lymphoidal tissue, uh, again, to react to things. And then in the colon, small intestine, and this happens to be the large intestine, here we see a plasma cells uh, that are producing antibodies uh, that will go into the lumen of the colon to counter things that are exposed to. Even in the appendix, the appendix has a, uh, this is a germinal center right here, lymphoidal tissue with a, a germinal center and a, a follicle uh, that it would be, there's this simple columnar epithelium that lines the epithelium in, in this region. Uh, another organ is the spleen. And the spleen has a capsule and it has projections that go in through there. And then as the vasculature comes in through there, you have a central artery and a periarterial sheath. So this is like an arterial, and then there would be a sheath around it, and sometimes they have a follicle with a germinal center associated with it. And then on inside, uh, and these follicles uh, here with the germinal centers uh, uh, make the white ball. So this is white pulp and red pulp. So we don't have cortex and medulla in the spleen. You have white pulp and red pulp. In the in the red pulp, you have these cords, splenic cords and sinuses in between uh, that we'll see. Uh, in the capsule and throughout the sinus, you have these reticular fibers, uh, which are branched fibers that help support the cells that are inside there. There is a capsule in the spleen, as we can see, this is the white pulp and the red pulp out through here. In the red pulp, we have the spleen uh, strands or the Bilroff strands and uh, the sinuses. This is a sinus that we have here. Uh, and the primary function of the spleen is filtration of the blood. Uh, the spleen has no afferent lymphatics either because it's not cleaning lymph, it's cleaning blood. And here you can see the central artery uh, and the a periarterial sheath and a follicle here, characteristic of the vasculature going into the spleen and being part of the white pulp, and this being the red pulp. In the red pulp, you have the Bill Roth strands or the spleen strands uh, and the sinuses, and that's what we're seeing in here. Uh, right in the marginal zone, the marginal zone being uh, right between the white pulp and the red pulp, uh, you have these penicillary arteries. So you have a series, the word penicillin means branched. And so you have this branching and uh, these arteries end blindly. They don't end in a capillary, they just end. And so they uh, open and close, releasing whole blood into these uh, 
build raw strands that then has to percolate through uh, and squeeze through uh, the, the cells lining those. And we can see those. Here's a penicillary arteries here, 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 here. Uh, that's, uh, that's in there, central artery, and this is in the marginal zone. So this is a central artery, paratory sheath, and a marginal zone where you have the, the penicillary arteries. And so the penicillary arteries empty into the Billroth strands without a capillary. Uh, and here we see the splenic um, uh, sinuses in through there. The Billroth strands, uh, this is the Billroth strands uh, in here, and you see the reticular fibers. So again, we can see the strands. So you have two things. You have sinuses and you have strands. Uh, and then uh, these, uh, so these are Bill Roth strands or splenic strands uh, that we can see. And you see the cells are kind of taller than typical uh, endothelial cells. And what happens is that blood that's dumped out with the, uh, uh, with the penicillary arteries uh, is in a strand it has to squeeze through these literal cells so these are all the same cells it squeezed through there and as red blood cells get older they're less pliable and macrophages are there as you see right here's a macrophage and you can see macrophages with this staining here is ready to eat up these cells so uh, here we see the penicillary arteries uh, here here and here uh, in the Billroth strand which is what this is and this is a sinuses with the so-called literal cells, which are picket fence-like cells, uh, that the blood has to, uh, is dumped here, has to squeeze in through there to get back into the bloodstream. And as a, as a cell ages, it's less pliable, uh, and so the red blood cells are eaten up by the spleen, uh, ultimately, uh, in the end. Now, the main player producing the bone marrow uh, originates in the bone marrow, at least, is a lymphocyte is the main player of your immune, immune response and see we see the nucleus of a of a lymphocyte and the cytoplasm is mostly nucleus as it's just a quiescent cell waiting until it sees its antigen so it can respond make a plasma cell or not and so that brings us back in the fetal organs and bone marrow you have uh, cells originating but there's primary lymphoidal organs Oh, which is the thymus and the bone marrow that we see. And in the thymus, we have the antigen independent. So you need these to develop without the antigen. And then you have secondary lymphoidal organs, antigen dependent. They need lymph node, spleen, lymphoidal nodules. That's where the immune cells are reacting to antigen uh, for the response uh, that we want. And so in summary, uh, the purpose of the immune system is to protect against foreign invaders and to maintain a germ-free environment. To do that, we have the lymph node, the thymus, spleen, appendix, uh, to, uh, uh, and throughout the body we had um, uh, lymph vessels uh, and uh, lymph nodes to be able to have surveillance throughout the body. We have a couple of questions. The main purpose of lymphoidal traffic, the circulation of lymphocytes throughout the body is to place the response of lymphocytes in the region of specific antigens. Remember that you had to uh, have a specific response and you have to get the antigen and the reactive cell together and that's part of the circulation. Uh, to stimulate lymphoidal growth, no. Meiosis, of course not. Uh, to clear out lymph ducts? No. So the answer is A. Uh, the functions of, a, of the spleen include clean the blood of particulate matter? Yes. Remove warm red blood cell? Yeah. Remove ribosomes from reticulocytes that give rise to red blood cells? Yes. So the answer is E. Which lymphoidal organ contains penicillin arteries or both afferent and lymphatic? Okay, the lymph node uh, has afferent, efferent lymphatics. Uh, the spleen has penicillary arteries. Uh, the thymus doesn't have either one of those, and so the answer is D. So we want to thank the various uh, books that contributed uh, some of the uh, drawings or illustrations that we see there. Uh, they made those. I did not make those, and we thank them for their contribution to that. Uh, this is a, a park near Liberty Hill, 
uh, in Texas. You can see it was in the fall when he had the beautiful color uh, out through there. So that's the end of Medical School Histology Basic Lymphoidal Tissue. If this information was useful to you, please consider subscribing uh, to VIBS Histology YouTube uh, and to share it with your colleagues uh, who may be able to benefit from that as well. Thank you.